Anyang, Katia, Wurian, the ghouls next, next door. door. <laughs> we <laughs> sort of did it. Look at us be. We, we, so, weirdly enough, it was harder to figure out how to speak Korean than I think either of us expected. Yeah. I don't even know if we did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> We're really sorry. We tried. Um, I only knew how to say very hi. difficult. Yeah. yeah. I was like, yo, Maseo, that's on the phone. I don't know how to say, oh, cool. I was like, I don't know how to say anything else other than that. Yeah. There, what else exists? I'd say what I found in looking is that a lot of the the words are longer. Yeah. Than like what like American is English, you know? Okay. Yes. American English, we said things Europe. differently. Um, we say words to your <laughs> yeah. face. But as if you didn't know, we're doing Korea now. This is, this is what our, our Just topic forever. Is. We're doing Korean now. <laughs> now we are. No. Uh, for this episode specifically, we're going to be talking about Korean horror or K horror. For our foreign horror film series. Or repeat it. Foreign horror. Yeah. Horror series. Mm hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've done J horror from Japan. We've done French. Ex- new extremity. F horror, if you will. <laughs> F horror. We're, we're doing, doing it by K letter. K horror today, and next week we're gonna do I horror for Ital- Italian. Um, so yeah, uh, Korean horror. I will say I heard about Korean horror in recent years, like about how specifically it is like well known for it's gore and for it being like intense like i i remember hearing about how it's very intense and that they stick with you like a lot of the like like stories stick with you melodramatic if you will (laughs) indeed um and even like so in high school actually um my best friend miranda had me watch tale of two sisters um and at the time i didn't even know it was korean like, I, I knew it was subtitled, but I was just, like, yeah. going in blind. You're just, <laughs> just like, like, this is a language. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is a, you know, this is a culture I'm learning about. But that one, the ending to that film has stuck with me for all of existence since I watched it. And oh. it will always be there. Um, there's an American version um, called The Uninvited, I believe. Oh, I've um, seen that. Yeah. Which is real bad in comparison to what... Tale of Two Sisters is. But Tale of Two Sisters had that kind of same horror that I was used to with, like, J-horror, where it had, like, the bodies that move weird, and there was a ghost woman. Um, And it was... It was, like, unsettling in that way, but I do remember, like, the psychological element, and it was, like, a twist, and I was, like, what? Um, which I thought was, As like... twists, too. <laughs> what? That's my brain. Um, yeah, so that was, like, really cool. It was good <laughs> in that it was impactful. And so I watched horror, like, Korean horrors more recently and, like, know that they're kind of, like, on the up and up as far as, like, being really, really well-known for its horror like a modern horror like it's kind of transforming a lot of the landscape like i it pops up all the time on netflix or yeah. anywhere where people are like have you seen that like new korean horror film and it's it's always really unique and fun yeah i would say i had no background in korean horror until we like other than by accident because i didn't know the uninvited was a remake um <laughs> yeah so i mean even though yeah as you said it like doesn't compare but yeah, I had not really been exposed to Korean horror until we started watching it. I really hadn't seen any. And um, I definitely really enjoyed the films that we watched. I felt like there's just like not enough time to watch all of the yeah. new and really good ones. Um, because in researching this, there's so many mentioned that it just came out like in the last, I want to say like 20, 30 years. Yeah. That we're like, you need to see this. And I was like, I, we have a week. <laughs> yeah. We, can <laughs> we would love to do this more, but like a week, I can't watch 80 films a week. Like, it yeah. to limit my list, friend. I found that in all these foreign films. Yeah. But, um, at least with some of the other ones, I had already seen some of them though. So this was unique and that I had not seen any of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely cool. And I, and, and different. And I enjoy that there's all these aesthetics that we're seeing. So 
some facts about Korean horror. Tell me about those facts. <laughs> so, like Kat was saying, um, a lot of the films that are really well known and renowned are in the recent years. Like, it doesn't have this like plethora of backlog of films and of horror films specifically. And there's reason for that, as there always is. Yeah, I mean, even if you had them, they're hard to find. Like, yes. They exist, maybe, but you don't over there. Yeah, and they won't have, like, subtitles yeah. because they're not made for us. Like, yeah. <laughs> we were rude and didn't show an interest, and so they were like, fine, we don't need you. Um, and they're not wrong. <laughs> they, don't, they don't need us. Um, yeah, so um, K-Horror has a, a, a really unique design and history. Um, one that can be actually compared slightly to... The French extremist movement and J-horror kind of, like, honestly, surprisingly, like, I found when we were doing this research, I was like, there's some things that it's like a mash between the two histories a little bit yeah. in ways of, like, how those affect its its media, right? Yeah. So, like, um, as Korean horror was affected by more than one catalyst for their horror styles, like, it was... Let's just start at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the wealth of Korean horror really only prospered rather late in the game. Um, there were, of course, horror movies um, or movies with horror elements throughout the years. But due to heavy censorship, it wasn't until the 1960s that they really took hold. Censorship also happened in France. Exactly. Um, the first semblance of a horror film was in 1934 when the first image of a ghost was on screen. Uh, ah, J-horror. Uh, this is an adaption of the moralistic ghost fable, the story of Fang Hua and Hong Ryong. I'm sorry if I say this wrong. You tried. <laughs> I don't know if that's right either. I have no idea. Okay. (laughs) Um, However, it's hard to trace uh, the horror cinema history because of the censorship and the presence of war. The war, like what we saw with French films, did directly impact their horror stories later. Um, We will be addressing a film that represents this a bit, specifically their relationship with the Japanese in our film section with the whaling. Dope. Um, From 1910 until the end of the Second World War, Korea was under the colonial rule of the Japanese, and all cultural production was strictly controlled. Because of the Japanese rule, most films during this time were propaganda-focused on highlighting and supporting the messages of Japanese colonial government. As, As propaganda would. is to do. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, look at how what good stuff is happening. And they're like, I want to make films. <laughs> like, it has, to, it has to say how cool we are. I want to be a people. <laughs> like, no, no. <laughs> you cannot. Um, which meant that personal expression was halted. After this Japanese censorship phase, Koreans attempted to jumpstart their films with Choi and Q's 1940s film For Freedom. However, they were again halted by more war. This time it was a civil war between the North and the South in the 1950s. Which is the one we're more familiar with. Yeah. So there was like... (laughs) Outsiders looking in. Yeah. Because it's still here. Like we're still experiencing what that is. Right. But it was essentially like censorship from the Japanese. And then they got out of that war and had like this brief reprieve. And then it was like right back into war. So they didn't really get a lot of time to breathe. Which is just like with the French. It was like one war after the other. One tragedy after the other. Yeah. After that war, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, the country was hit with rapid modernization and westernization, which inspired its cinema to enter its first golden age. Beautiful. These films were mostly melodramas and war films that highlighted the country's traumas. So it was an outlet for them to, just like the French ones, express what was happening to them. To give their voices, like, they've been silenced for all this time, so they needed to, like, repair that. Um, These melodramas featured stories that told of romance, female suffering, and a defeatist narrative that would later influence the horror genre, too. These films dominated the cinematic landscape, leaving not much room for horror, until one of the most impactful Korean horror films ever made, The Housemaid. It was released in 1960 by Kim Ki-young, and it's often seen as the f- true first Korean horror film, and it has left its impact forever on this genre. Like, it really kickstarted it. So much so, they made two different versions. Yeah. 
after that one. Yeah. <laughs> so like, this is so good. Why reinvent the wheel? Well, yeah, we'll just reinvent this one movie <laughs> twice. Yeah. The housemaid featured the tropes that the melodramas and the war films had. So it fit really well into the cinematic landscape. So it had the female suffering and a really sad defeatist narrative. Um, this film, by donning the mask of those popular films, uh, but instead of being clothed in this horror, like, genre, forge the path for the future of K-horror. They yeah. could just put on the clothes, <laughs> like, and was just like, this is a horror movie, but we're talking about all the things that we want to talk about. Finally, because there were censorship. Yeah, we're allowed. Um, the housemaid led the way for a cycle of supernatural revenge tales, focusing primarily on the cruelly murdered woman. So... Similar to Japanese horror and, and also um, in French horror, too, there's a lot to do with, like, women rising back and, like, fighting back after being hurt a lot of the time, unjustly. Um, another important influence on the K-horror genre is similar to that of J-horror in that they were inspired by their fables and tales of ghosts, haunts, and others, uh, supernatural beings from folklore. Um, the Korean go- folklore. Yeah, it tells you stuff. Uh, it teaches you. Uh, the Korean ghosts and supernatural creatures known as the Gumiho and Wanhan influence much of their horror through the 60s and 70s. Like most folklore, and similar to what we discussed in J-horror, their films feature tragic tales of unrest, wrongdoing, and brutal karma. But in the more, like, Western sense of karma, which where it's like what goes around comes around, not like... All karma is, like, pretty much you did a bad thing, <laughs> so bad things happen. Yeah. Um, in Korean horror cinema, which is a uh, paper or a book? I think it's a book. I pulled a lot of information from it, like, almost all of it. Yeah, mostly this is from the, the book Korean Horror Cinema by Alison Pierce. Um, and in it, she explains that in the classic Korean horror film, when good people die, they return from the dead to seek revenge. When bad people commit evil, they are punished by permanent death. Suffering is shared by all parties, but justice ultimately prevails. We are given a clear worldview with consistent rules and outcomes, reflecting contemporary moral values, societal and cultural pressures, and a vested interest in Han, which is a form of grief. And, like, dealing with that. Dope. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're learning things. Like you say teaching your you. words, but also supporting <laughs> You're doing so well. Um, by the end of the 1970s, so you see, like, by <laughs> this is when it's really, like, kicking in, you know? Because yeah. it took them all that time. So I feel like that's a, a big reason why they just hadn't gotten noticed. But also, I think it's one of the strengths. Yeah. Because it came later, like, their work is more honed and, like, skilled. Because they now have technology that can allow that. Well, yeah, because they rapidly modernized. Yeah. So, so it's just like... It's just like, well, let's rapidly develop a horror genre. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Let's do it. We'll, we'll make our own our, style. We'll do all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so in the 1970s... Uh, K-horror transformed again. It's still influenced directly by the political landscape and continued to create outstanding horror films. However, the Western industry overshadowed these films, which unfortunately leaves some of the best K-horror films unwatched, despite being arguably just as profound in message as the Western horror films, if not more so. Because yeah. in the 70s... like we, them. It's like... Ugh. Yeah. In, in, like, in America, the 70s, we had films that did mean something. Um... And were there, but they were relatively, like, slashers, right? Or yeah. they were, like, spooky, <laughs> like, kind yeah. of things, right? So, that like, horror was picking up here in the 70s. So, it's it's believable that we would be distracted. But that sucks because then we didn't make any efforts to make those attainable and viewable yeah. here. So, they're kind of yeah. un unaccessible. Which is yeah. sad, because <laughs> they sound really great. Um, in the 1980s, while America was creating slashers and conveying violence on screen for fun, and while the French were not yet secure in their representation of trauma, Korea was enforcing what was known as the 3S policy. Which is fun. Oh, so good. <laughs> and I feel like unknowingly America has also <laughs> put this in. But this policy adopted by Chun doo Hwan. Uh, government in 1980 was created with the intention to distract the Korean people from the political unrest and social and in social injustices or abuse around them and instead entertain them with sports, screen, 
and sex. Dope. With this, the censorship the Korean filmmakers had been combating against for decades was relaxed. Because before it was like propaganda, propaganda, and now it's like sex. <laughs> so much so. Distract them with sex. <laughs> and they were like, well, I guess. I mean, thanks. And uh, fitness. <laughs> and fitness. Um, so much so that there was the first boom of the Korean erotic movie. Ooh. Because of this. Because now we can do whatever we want. Sex. Uh, horror, of course, ever the opportunist, uh, saw this as the opportunity to finally thrive and kicked off the revitalization of the genre by returning to its origins with a reinvention of the housemaid. Like <laughs> In the form before. of the film called Suddenly a Dark Night, uh, which is the loose retelling of a tale which adds copious amounts of gratuitous nudity and a distinctly Korean supernatural element in the form of a small shamanistic totem that grows to human size and goes on a murderous rampage. So Korean Chucky. Yes. <laughs> the Dude. totem. Nice. Uh, same time period. <laughs> like 1980s. Yeah, we were also doing that. Um, other films during this time thrive not because of their violence, but actually because of their honest representation of the family unit and explored more traditional beliefs um which is still happening and one of the films we highlight today is going to do that as well yeah. um there's an interesting fact though in 2011 the korean film archive in seoul hosted a retrospective of korean horror from the 1980s a rare opportunity to see many of these films due to their perceived inferior quality in problematic political context the majority of horror from this period remains unavailable in stark contrast to the unprecedentedly wide distribution uh, that the most recent wave of korean horror has enjoyed so yeah. we lost their history but we have their future we have all the cool <laughs> we stuff that's learned. been coming up and, like, I would argue, as we, like, are really looking at it, like, we see some of the folklore. It's, like, some of that is just still very present in the things that we're wa we watched for this. And I'm sure, like, based on the long book I tried to read, um, <laughs> in a lot of other films that we didn't get to watch. Yeah. Um, so the biggest one that I kept seeing pop up is I'm going... I don't know if I said this right. And every time I Googled it, they had different names. Oh. So uh, the Wan Hun... Uh, is a definitive motif of Korean horror and initiates generic conventions quite different from its Asian and Western film counterparts. So essentially, the Wanho's personification is not a personification. It's not a personification of a demon. It is instead, or God, or monster. It is instead a human spirit. So typically, but arguably not, arguably not always, a young, innocent woman for whom a conflict or sexual violation are the common causes of an early death. So essentially, yeah. this is someone who was killed wrongly. Yeah. They were taken before their time. They were accused of something and then murdered. Yeah. And now they're coming back. This sounds familiar. I know. It's like you watch films about this or like see themes like this in other cultures. Um, <laughs> so essentially, the culture... Definitions of the 100 complex, as well as how the female spirit functions as a powerful social allegory from the 1960s. Uh, in Korean horror cinema, which in and of itself is like a hybrid situation. Yeah. Um, what we kind of see a lot of as it seems to represent like female oppression mm -hmm. during that time slash for a very long period of like Korean history, especially with like all the wars happening and like a civil war situation or arguably still in Northern Korea. Yeah. Um, still just propaganda. like the oppressed female yeah. who is like accused of this, that, and the other thing, but essentially of losing their innocence is kind of like the common theme. Mm -hmm. And if they are wrongfully accused, that's real messed up. That's when it's and residual. now we need vengeance. Yeah. Now we're going to come back. But what I thought was interesting is that it's not like a demon or like, an evil spirit even it's a human mm -hmm. it is like human life clinging yeah hold and on. in this like middle ground kind of like limbo or whatever that we see oh, in the like christianity okay. or at least that was kind of like my interpretation of it so essentially the typical northern american viewer does not have the same insight to, as a korean audience because we don't have all the same stuff going on yeah we don't have this background um but then we kind of fail to realize why the vengeful female ghost is used so often 
So it's kind of just seen as like, like, oh, that's just a thing that happens all the time. There's actually lots of reasons. Mm-hmm. So uh, one hundred or the vengeful female ghost, although I would argue, not that I'm an expert on Korean anyway, <laughs> but based on the films that we watched, I think there are situations where maybe they're not female. Maybe yeah. it's just a person who was accused of something. Yeah. And then murdered too soon. Uh. Um, so was birthed out of the culture of the consistent female oppression in Korea. Uh, essentially, this man... Oh, I'm going to say his name so wrong. He he Joang Cho states that uh, the assessment of women's status in any Confucian society is highly complex issue and perhaps nowhere more than in Korea, which is generally described as an extreme form of patriarchy, especially during the Yi dynasty. Yeah. So though the lingering bad memories embodied in these spirits can be described as Han, a deep resentment of injustice, as you had said earlier, mm-hmm. um, the spirit and spirits intentions after being separated from its body by death are manifest manifested as Han. So Han is the resentful element that comes from an unfulf- unfulfilled ghost wandering in this world, seeking revenge and a way to fill its worldly desires. So he goes on to describe the revenge of the spirit as a healing process. Which oh, I think it's that's so very different. Yeah. interesting. It's not this negative thing. It's like, like as opposed to J horror, where it was like, you're gonna be stuck like this forever. This is just this now. is this like, is just me now. We're doing this is it. Me now. <laughs> yeah, with this, it feels like this is the way to healing. Mm-hmm. This is the way to fix it. And uh, it's interesting because you see a lot of American narratives that wrap around the opposite idea mm-hmm. that revenge won't make it better. Yeah, or even in one of the Korean films that we watched, revenge didn't make it better. Yeah, it was made just... A, yeah. Made it just as bad. It was still bad. An eye for an Even eye. though he wasn't a ghost. So, yeah. <laughs> Either no, way. he was real. Um, so, yeah, it just like it resolves the issue of being like torn from the living too early mm. and lets them rest. So, you get to see that a lot. So, <laughs> and it was basically just an allegory essentially for female oppression and the revenge that came. That's so nice. Yeah. But, uh, the re- revenge of a female ghost is a cliche of a lot of Asian horror movies. Uh, within the global success of the ring, a female ghost in a white gown, uh, long black hair has come to be regarded as the specific Japanese icon of horror by the Western audiences. Yet Japanese horror explores transnational film cultures to articulate a national experience of otherness. And that's mostly informed by like Buddhism and Shinto. Mm-hmm. Um, but similarly, Korean horror has evolved using generic experimentation informed by other national cinema in order to communicate the shared anxiety and traumatic experiences of its local communities. So they also kind of feel like us or others, but it's more internalized. Yeah. So like it goes a lot to the family dynamic where honestly you'll see a Wan Han be a representation of otherness in their family. So like a cast off yeah, female like relative, sheep. a wife, a mm-hmm. daughter who is not doing as she should in terms of society. Mm. They are cast off. They have a sense of otherness. It's kind of like feeling trapped in a family dynamic that maybe is not working for you anymore culturally is the vibe that I got. But essentially the white outfit that represents like purity and then also the hair has been a like token element of this so we see that a little bit in the wailing with the girl in the white dress mm-hmm. with the black hair yeah um one thing that's interesting is that they said that the reason that they had like long hair and like kind of this like uncontrollable energy that was like in contrast to like a married woman like, if their hair was, like, tangled or, like, uncombed, mm-hmm. was to represent, like, their rejection of Confucian oh. society. So, essentially, like, I'm not just going to be a, a woman in relation to my family or, like, a wife or, like, serving this family yeah. dynamic, which is just very much Confucian mm-hmm. ideology. Um, I am going to branch out against that. And then that kind of feeling of, like, that's in direct contrast with what is expected yeah. of me. There's an also really fun spirit that I'm not going to, because we don't have time, but it's a fox spirit. And I just thought that was really cool. So it was com- called a gumio. Um, and it's in a lot of Korean folklore and legends. We did not see in our films, though. So it's we arguably not them. necessary. For this. But it's so cool. And it this is, um, isn't this the thing that is in um, 
what is it, Love, Death, and Robots, the Netflix. I think so. There's like an episode with a, it's a fox that seduces men. Mm-hmm. And, and then, eats their yeah, hearts. And she becomes like a, a robot. It's a really good one. I don't remember the name of it, but that's, I pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah, it's probably like back to that. Um, but we also see something that's very similar to the one hon, or it's or arguably like a takeoff of a one hon, um, is the Gekui, a wayfarer ghost. So that's someone who has died before reaching like their home. Mm. So essentially they're murdered or died with regular things away from their like home or homeland or like a place mm. where they have their family. So being like a or foreigner. Safety. Yes. Or- yeah a foreigner away from home dying out of their land um dying on like the side of the road or on the road away from their house that's a classic one yeah um and they're called away for so in korean shamanism it was believed that those who died from drowning or those who died away from home as a victim of a tragic death by suicide murder or accident became wayfarer ghosts or gekui also called Oh my gosh. Okay. Meaning ghosts by death away from home. People feared these haunted spirits, unable to ascend to the heavens, drifted amongst humans, causing calamities to random targets. So mm-hmm. I would argue the whaling is that ghost. Yeah. Um, Similar, yeah. Yeah, because it's random targets. It's like, ah, everybody. And not going to say spoilers, but like there's car involved. You see it. <laughs> it happens. Um, so this is why uh, families preferred to bring home in home patients from hospitals when they found out like death was inevitable because like yeah, you don't want to have an safe. unhappy spirit um ordinarily people sought the service of shamans to hold exorcism rituals which i thought was really interesting for resolving grievances or stage spirit appeasing rites at buddhist temples so one thing you see is a lot of like different religions all coming together or like even like somewhat of a conflict between them or just kind of mm-hmm. like i don't know what the answer is so let's try all of them <laughs> yeah would you like to see a lot of like overlapping and overflow between these things so to help the spirit of a dead family member ascend to heaven without holding a bitter grievance um they do these rituals and it was also they blame them for like diseases or plagues or like things that were going around they said that those were wayfarer gross attacking random targets mm. um but shamans were often hired to provide a healing through exorcism rituals and that was kind of what we see in the whaling with the knives and the yeah that whole routine with the dead animals and it was interesting like the brandishing of the knife to threaten the ghost the knife was slung to the ground it landed at the tip pointed outward the ghost if it did that the ghost had left the house and there's just like there's like a lot of like rituals and traditions that go around that were really interesting um but essentially they had like christianity or catholicism am i wrong catholicism what catholicism has exorcists yep Yes. So I thought that was really interesting that there's like an overflow of that, even though very separate, very different. Yeah. You do see some Christianity flow through Korea. Yeah. Definitely because of like Westernization and like throwing all the different options of the world <laughs> yeah. on one little, little place. I do enjoy that they laughed at him for being Christian in the in the film the wailing yeah and you just i think in that film especially you see a lot of these things like the themes of like overlapping and conflicting religions the fact that they're going to get like a shaman but they're also going to a church and they're also going like yeah there's also like buddhist things happening you know it's yeah interesting. or even in this where you say in a shaman's home a pair of shoes were sometimes hung on the shrine um one, the shoe is stolen in the whaling we'll talk about, and there is shoes hanging during yeah. the ritual. So it's like, I think it's uh, the whaling is a de- direct ref- uh, reflection of this type of horror. Yeah, and definitely with like the human like spirit, I thought also because that's like a really big line from the film when he's like, it's a human. And yeah. they're like, I didn't know ghosts could be human. What do you mean? Like, it's the whole. Yeah, minute that's so where he true. has that moment, and like the girl, she is in a white dress when he first sees her. Her hair is all matted and tangled. Oh my god! So it's just like reading this. I was like, oh my god, this movie had so much going on that I did not realize because I had not researched before we watched it. Yeah, so it was cool. Speaking of movies, just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared.
Murderous Miners brings true tales of children who have killed. Premeditated murders, accidental killings and deaths, from toddlers to 18-year-old killers, no one is too young to take a life. Join me, War Baby, as I try to tell these stories of the young who've killed, the lives they took, and even the ones who've been left behind. Why do children kill? What do we do with young killers? And do they kill again? And until next time, don't be scared. As we do. Yeah. Um, Let's start with I Saw the Devil. Sure. Um, I didn't. He wasn't hanging out with me. But I will say in Mm -hmm. uh, what I think is funny is so it's titled I Saw the Devil and it's about. Well, let me tell you what it's about. Uh, A dangerous psychopath's latest victim is the pregnant fiance of elite special agent Su Hyun. Obsessed with revenge, Su Hyun is determined to track down the murderer, even if it means becoming a monster himself. Yeah. And so this is very much a film that was like, where the moral of an eye for an eye and the world goes blind kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's definitely like, um, he you think it's going to be this like cat and mouse type thriller where you're Mm -hmm. like, that's what the American film would have been. (laughs) The American film would have been this guy just trying to track down the guy who did it. It would be seven. (laughs) Yeah. Or arguably uh, John Wick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because he's going after someone who's also skilled in murder. Yeah. That's kind of like where my angle was. Or even taken, right? Like mm-hmm. you have special skills and then he's doing that, right? <laughs> I have a special set of skills <laughs> for men like you. Yeah, exactly. And he did. Um, but then <laughs> upon his first encounter with the guy who actually did murder his fiance, um, Suhyun is is playing with him the way that a cat actually plays with mice. Yeah. Uh, in that it is a game, right? Yeah, we don't you catch him, him right you release. You catch, he's, you release. He's doing a real psychological thing about it. <laughs> yeah. And I so I think what's interesting is that we have this concept of like humans acting devilishly, right? Like they mm-hmm. are acting evil. And that there's this very, very gray area of what is good and bad. Like it, yeah. I don't think they are trying to to make Suhian a hero. I think it's very clear by the way that everyone who is pres- presumably like the good a good person is reacting to him in that way. Like you were not acting correct, right? But there is a sense of victory that you're feeling in revenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's a, a really good turn where it's just like this is the repercussions of your actions. Like you can't get away with that. Um, where so with this, it's a very like in the real the realm of the real Mm -hmm. um in regards to what is evil it's just people right um Mm -hmm. whereas when we watch the wailing it's like we actually do see the devil there's so much supernatural (laughs) stuff happening, and it's yeah it's just all supernatural which is like super cool um but i would say that the same themes are in this in that we are confronted with the that tale like moral tales yeah, what was interesting, though, is um, I guess in a lot of the research that we were doing, we saw that there's good and there's bad, and bad will lose and good will prevail. Yep. Where I guess the line between what was good was very foggy, you know, which yeah. was different, honestly. It seemed like they, the themes that I was reading was like, revenge is good, it's healing. Yeah. And this was like, hey, wait, wait, though, for ghosts. Yeah. Not, not for people. You're a person. You're a people. Don't do it. You have to go through the proper you channels of justice. You have to be murdered unjustly and then seek vengeance. <laughs> yeah. Or just let your wife handle it. Yeah, like she should have been the one. Let her come back and get that guy. Yeah. And he's like, no, I don't. No. Yeah. I'm going to go do my thing. <laughs> I'm good at murder. Let's go. Yeah, that's my skill set. Yeah, I think what was very interesting, and I remember you remarking when we were watching this, and I guess I just didn't really pick up on it when I first watched it, but um, was that there are a lot of murderers 
in yeah, this film. There are so many different serial killers. They're just hanging out like friends. They're just in the same area, which is crazy, right? But I think that's a representation of the war itself, right? Is mm-hmm. that these are the people who are your neighbors. Like, they are just around the corner, right? Like, at the time, you were afraid of the other people in your country. You were afraid of people around you. Um, and, you, like, war makes people do crazy things and dangerous things. Yeah, wartime life is just very different. It's real messed up. Lots of, like, what's the law? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't account for us. Yeah. It's kind of dynamics that you kind of just see where it's, like, and it's hard for people to adjust. So it's, like, you're trying to win a war. You're trying to, like, get rid of the enemy. You mm-hmm. have to kill them in war because yep. war is violence and bloodshed. Um, to do that. So how do you just not do that yeah. <laughs> after? Like, that's what you were made to do. Arguably and a lot stop. and gruesomely. And it's people and who look like you who are you. Like... And, like, like this now. Mm-hmm. Like, you think, like, that's what, that was your job. Yeah. You did that job for 15 years. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, however long. And that's what you know how to do. And it was real traumatizing, so it's like, you're kind of like, that's all I know I'm good at, man. I tried mm-hmm. to do normal life. This isn't working for... I think I need to eat people. Yeah, exactly. Because there's... <laughs> so there are... So there's a main villain. Um, it features the actor Choi min Suk, who um, is old boy, which mm-hmm. is a very... That one That one is not horror. I would, I so would argue that thriller. there's horror elements because it's thriller. Yeah. Um, but he's also trained to Basan, which is best so dad. great. Yeah, because in Trade to Basan, he is arguably best dad. He's the best dad that ever was, even though he's not even a dad yet. Like, he's the best. He's such a great character in that. And to see him so nice. be a completely o- o- like opposite of that and just be this awful, disgusting, like, <laughs> like evil person, right? Um, but he's the main villain who killed... The uh, main person's wife, who also is a famous um, Korean actor in horror um, as well. It was fantastic. Yeah. All the acting I've noticed in Korean film, but also just like Asian films in general, the children actors. Oh, yes. The adult actors. I'm just like, there is not a second where I am not convinced this is real. Yeah. Yeah. I am convinced I am watching reality unfold before me. Even the most wild craziness yeah. i'm just like this is this is real i'm scared this is real <laughs> these yeah. actors are so good um and when we're following this amazing actor uh he encounters two uh serial killers in a car um spoilers uh which is funny because it's like that <laughs> joke that, that people after. have where it's this like the guy picks up a hitchhiker and the hitchhiker's like, are you worried that I'd be a serial killer? And he's like, the odds of two serial killers being in a car is pretty slim. And then the guy's like, what? Um, and then it just happens that there are two serial killers in the car already plus him. And so that was wild because they had this guy in the truck. It was crazy. But then he eventually meets up with an old friend and they have a dialogue in which they discuss that they had met in the war, that yeah. they were in the war and that that... It, corrupted them Mm -hmm. and changed them so like the guy the his friend is also a serial killer and actually eats people and like he can't do anything else because that's like presumably how he had survived at some point and now he is broken and there's a woman with him that has never explained what her entire role is just that she isn't somehow connected to him and like more or less indebted to like, what he does, like, because at some point she tries to, like, protect them. Um, yeah, I wonder if it was either during the war or maybe he was potentially going to be one of her victims. And she was like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I'll eat people, too. Totally <laughs> I don't even good. know if she was eating people, though. I think um, it was yeah, a weird, it was, it was a very weird dynamic yeah. that I do wish, I wish I got her story. I really didn't. I was upset because <laughs> I was like, I want to know what she's doing. Like, is she also a serial killer? What's her deal? Um, we do not get that. But I thought it was very interesting that that's thrown in there or not thrown in there, that it, it's constructed in there um, as an a way of explanation for why they are the way they are. Yeah. And it's like, OK, we can see how they're murderous. But like it's a I and I guess like it didn't take years of war, but it did take seeing your fiance's head disembodied head to then trigger our main character 
She, well, yeah. he seemed like he was also already trained as like a agent of the government or like a CIA agent or maybe even like yeah. a government assassin was the vibe that guy. Like he was like pulled away in these kind of like secret everyone's mm-hmm. in suits yeah, but also with some like the cops kind of thing. He's like seemed like he was FBI level of Korean times. Yeah. yeah. I will say the the one thing that's that I think is worth mentioning for I See the Devil and uh, I Saw the Devil in other modern Korean films is this idea that like they were so censored and then they no longer have those censors, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas American film, we're very censored. Like, yeah. even with our gore films, like, those are highly censored and they're they're dropped off after a certain point. Um, and so with these, there's a... It doesn't stop. Like, we have torture porn and things like that, but this was 2011, which is after, like, Saw and them. But it... um, There's, like, a, the very first scene where the killer gets to the the girl Uh um was where i was like oh i'm not watching american film anymore because there's a scene where he essentially like hits her over the head and at that point i was like if this was an american film it would cut to black and we would wake up either in his lair or we'd we'd come back and someone found her body but in this it just kept going like he Uh kept hitting her and it went on for too long. For, but I remember just being like, wait, we're still here. And then yeah. that's how all of them were. Like every scene, I was just like, what? No, we're still here. Why have we not cut to black? <laughs> America, <laughs> help. This is the middle ground of unsafe. Yeah. Um, so I think um, the censorship really shows there and that they, they're not censored. So they're um, like, Let's they don't have do to worry. This. Yeah. Let's and it's go. still not. It's gratuitous in some ways, but yeah, no, was in a good in a good way. Yeah, we watched another film. We did. <laughs> um, so we also watched uh, the Wailing. The Wailing. Tell everyone what the Wailing is about. It's from 2016. Um, the director's <laughs> name is Hong Jina, uh, or Jinna. And in this tense supernatural thriller, a foreigner's mysterious appearance in a village causes suspicion among the locals, which turns to hysteria when people begin brutally killing each other for no reason. Yeah. Uh, The wailing is very long. I will start with that. It was super long. But I enjoyed it. It's like two and a half hours. It's almost three hours. But it was very long. Yeah. It was like... I need a resolution, but also, how are we still going? It's similar to when we watched The Curse, Narai The Curse, right? Mm-hmm. That was a very long film. Um, but just like with that film, I didn't feel like it was long because it should have ended at a different point and kept yeah, going, like which is a, still wasn't an American enough of thing. resolve that I felt comfortable with when it reached its, what, I guess, right? <laughs> Nor like other films would end it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it follows this, it's a... A unique film in that it, it it's several different genres thrown in to one basket, right? Mm-hmm. So you have like this buddy cop, like dopey film where he there's this. The, our main character is a dad who's a, a cop, and he's bad. He's very bad at being a cop. He's, such he's a bad so cop. silly. Um, he's bumbling. <laughs> he's just all over the place. He's afraid of everything, um, but also still like like struggling to have control there's like a little bit of this like um need to to be the man right and Uh to have control and he's just doing what needs to get done like he's doing his job because that's what the dad does and he takes his daughter out because that's what he like the dad does yeah um and then uh so we're first confronted with um a man who has killed like his entire family and he's very Mm -hmm. clearly unwell and he's got boils and stuff on him uh and so we also get this like tinge of like a zombie film yeah it was very reminiscent of like whoa that guy looks like he was dead (laughs) yeah he's just sitting there like rocking and like how is he (sighs) what (laughs) (laughs) yeah um it's what i think is cool is that you know it's this tiny town and it's like a gossip film turn deadly right Mm -hmm. it's so it reminded me and i for the life of me cannot remember um but there was a film featuring um mads mickelson where he was like us like he was this guy in the small i want to say icelandic or something Mm -hmm. town um and at one point he is 
accused of touching a child inappropriately. Like he was like a daycare worker. Yeah. And then it, it spirals out of control, which is um, honestly really messed up because that's actually happened in history. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's it essentially becomes like this witch hunt where they uh, accuse him. And, it, and it's shown in the film that he didn't do it and that yeah. it's like the parents like – influence the kids no um it's no it was like a a real <laughs> like a no, real no, film it's not like also the plot of freddy no Krueger. freddy Krueger actually did oh okay, yeah okay. with this it's like he didn't like that's what we're led to believe honestly okay. but it spirals out of control where like his whole life derails and like it's it's literally just like the town's secrets like whispering causes him to be murdered like viciously, like it was, it was a crazy wild ride. Um, and it was very violent. And that's what I was thinking when I was watching this, right? It's just like mm -hmm. you sprinkle one little rumor and it erupted into so much more, like it would not have been there. But the only reason that any of that stuff has like any weight is because that's a narrative that does exist in their culture. And so it's very easy to buy into, right? So there's mm -hmm. the, essentially the, the, what the story is or what they think it is is that the new guy in town is japanese mm -hmm. and so there's already this like aggression towards him or just like dislike yeah, because of their history like yeah. you know like mm -hmm. it, it's that's just a, what's gonna happen right yeah. um and so uh he already like for some reason is here and he very clearly has like closed himself off to the public because why, like, people are not nice, and they already start having that. But there's already, like, in the society, it's already weaved that he would be, like, not, like, he would be a villain, right? Mm -hmm. And then you mix that with, like, fables and witchcraft, essentially, and, like, this mm -hmm. lore of, like, there's demons and whatnot. Like, you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get this narrative, and people are going to believe you. Mm -hmm. So it just becomes, like, Salem Witch Trials, where... They think it's him, and it becomes brutal, and then it's repercussions for that. Um, I, it's very, very strong in its xenophobia. Yeah, no, I would one hundred percent agree, and I'd argue that spoilers that the ending of like the devil situation is that there's this whole line where he's like, "Well, you came down here and told me I was the devil. No matter what I tell you, you're gonna see me." how you think I'm going to be. Yeah. So I might as well just be like that. Like essentially he was wrongfully murdered. He was trying to protect the people. Mm -hmm. But like even after they found out that piece, they were so quick to like monsterize him, you know? Yeah. Like they were going to make him into whatever they needed to make him into. And they weren't going to believe what he had to say because they didn't want to listen to him. And I thought the fact he spoke very little, the amount he was just very quiet, mm -hmm. was kind of like that. I don't feel like I have a voice to speak up for myself. I would, I would say so. There's a there's a scene that really speaks to me as an American and a person of color in America, and yeah. it's the scene. So there's a part where our heroic buddy cop here um, is convinced that this guy has is, is has injured his daughter. That yeah. his daughter is now cursed, essentially, right? So he goes to his house and um, is, like, destroying his, his property and then proceeds to, like, beat his dog. Spoiler alert. So if you have if you have a weak stomach for dogs being hurt, he does. Yeah, it was real messed up. <laughs> it was messed I up. I almost wanted to turn it off there. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. It Just was very upsetting. Was, oof. Um, people but, find dogs. Yeah, exactly. But that, that whole scene, what really got me was that he is standing there and he is just quiet and stoic and just trying to remain calm. Like, cause he, uh, if it was like, so if we had a Korean against another Korean and you did that, like if you did that to one of his friends or whatever, that other guy would have reacted and would have been like, you can't do that here. How dare you? Like, this is injustice. Mm -hmm. But the Japanese man does not have that luxury. He has to remain calm because no matter what he does, he's going to be seen as a villain. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a very similar mapping of like behavior. Like when you were confronted with this aggression, like you do not have any other choice but to be 
calm and like really try to reason. Like he's like, I burn those pictures. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. I've got nothing. Like, I cannot explain to you because we have a, we can't ex- understand each other. You yeah. don't speak my language. I don't speak yours. We have a translator. It takes too long. And I he can't was also tell trying you. to, and he wasn't listening. He was just screaming at him. Exactly. So it was, that to me was very, very telling. And, and I don't know if it <laughs> resonates with everyone else, but I would say, um, as an American viewer, I saw that and that was a horror for me. I, yeah. I immediately was like. No, you can't do anything in this film to convince me that he is actually the bad guy. Um, One, because that is not okay. (laughs) It is not okay for you to make him the bad guy, which is why I when at the end it was all happening. It led me to listen harder and try to really surmise what was happening because I was like, he he's physically being the devil and he is taking pictures and it's supposed to be this whole connection or whatever. Um, but I really do believe like what you were saying that he was just personifying what they were looking at. Cause it did not matter. Like if he looked like, uh, if he looked like Buddha or, <laughs> or whatever, like that would look like the grace of God to them, they would not believe it. Yeah. So because they wanted to believe that he was the villain. They wanted to believe that he was the problem. And it was like, there was this big conflict in that, like the woman versus the shaman versus the old man shaman slash yeah. devil, you know, yeah. like who do you trust? Who do you listen to? Arguably like culturally, it would make sense that they would not want to trust the woman in white yeah. with the hair. Yeah. And that situation. She was the one who was doing vengeance. And you would trust the shaman who would normally be ridding you of this curse. Yeah. So it was interesting to see the other dynamic. Mm-hmm. And arguably, I I honestly wasn't sure because it seemed like she was really genuinely trying to be like, hey, please don't go home. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you what you need to do. Yeah. But it's and like, why should we trust you? <laughs> I know, but it was just like really tough for me because it's anything. I thought it was the other shaman that was bad, not her, not yeah. him. Yeah. And yeah, and it, it turned out to be the shaman who, who was a bad guy. And I think ultimately in my my perception of the events was that he was the the one who was pulling the strings and he was the one who was bad the whole time yeah and i mean it did seem like there was this other demon with that like zombie like guy Mm -hmm. who was coming back and doing crazy stuff yeah you know yeah the theory is that the the japanese man was possessed um and that at points he is not possessed because when they're chasing him and he is showing real fear and he has that whole incident that almost made me like cry when he's like crying and he's in pain and he's like why are they chasing me and I was just like this is very triggering um was uh essentially a time when he was no longer possessed because the other it was in the other guy yeah who had come after them so like I but I don't think that he was the ringmaster he was just a pawn and he was a very easy pawn because he looked like what they already feared yeah um and so yeah it features all those classic horror tropes um but it was it's phenomenal All right, these aren't our most creative ones, but let's do it. Yeah. So if you like it, good cop. Like, best dad in Train to Busan, except not. Um, or yeah. good dad in, or good cop in the first movie we watched, I Saw the Devil. Yeah, he was, he was arguably good cop. kind of bad, too. But, you know, whatever. Um, or, but he was good at being that, I guess. Yeah, and then bad cop, bad dad, second movie, The Wailing. So, yeah. How do you feel? It means bad. Yeah. I'm bad at this. Oh my god. <laughs> Good cop means you liked it. Bad cop means you didn't. Go. <laughs> uh, for Korean horror, uh, it's always going to be good cop for me because it is very unique. Um, I think it's so intense um, and I always feel challenged when I watch them. Um, it has like gore, but not in a way that I f- like it was a lot. It was a lot. Mm-hmm. It was a lot. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I saw the devil was a lot. Um, the wailing was just fun. Um, and then again, 
I think I'll, I think what the highlights of them are is the psychological tension that you feel like with mm-hmm. um tale of two sisters i saw the devil with even something like old boy train to basan right like everything becomes not about just like look at the scary thing that's happening it's like let's talk about people and how they deal with trauma <laughs> is that is, yeah is it was very like bulk of it <laughs> we're not going to talk about our whole country we're going to talk about a f- community a family yeah like a smaller unit to really bring all of those things into context and like what is the conflict here how are we working through it all yeah that kind of stuff. yeah because like you know um with a train to Busan, right is like we're just seeing people we're seeing this train full of people whereas like this is a zombie film the entire world is made of zombies but that doesn't matter we are on this train we're just getting this group of people best dad to help (laughs) bad dad be better dad yeah and and he does right and there's a kid who's super spunky and her little aloha at the end oh my god kills me uh the the children actors are really phenomenal the daughter in um the wailing is phenomenal she is so good good. like at freaking out and also providing sympathy um and sadness and just being like this poor baby super cute all of them are so cute yeah Willie was cute. She was super crazy and creepy. And then turned to be some little girl. Oh my god. Yeah. My heart. She needs to win all the awards. I swear. Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah. It's I, I really like the way that it treats people and it's very honest. And even when you have supernatural elements thrown in, it's not about the ghost. It's not about like the curse really, right? It's about, about what's what's, what it's about saying. how these people are dealing with it and how and if they trust each other and if they protect each other um and also how extreme can we get because we can because we're allowed we can do whatever we want and we're gonna do it should we sh- have this guy be struck by lightning twice yeah <laughs> it's like <laughs> and that's not the worst thing that happens in this film right, right? I mean, yeah i would also agree uh good cop good dad yeah yeah, I love Korean horror films. I didn't know I did. No, I did. It's cool. It was really fun. I, I mean, I love Train to Busan the first time I watched it. I know we didn't talk about it much. Love yeah. that movie. I love The Wailing. I loved... I saw The Devil. I hated the ending of The Wailing at first until I read stuff, and then I was like, okay. Yeah. I get it. Cool. Check. Excellent. Yeah. It was saying a lot of stuff, yet also being very confusing. I understand. Yeah. It's, it's cool. very Creative long. Creative arts. And it's also super artistic. It was artistic. very long. <laughs> um, and then I really enjoyed I Saw the Devil in terms of, like, the intensity of it. Like, I was invested, you yeah. know, definitely. And I think the actor is just so versatile. It's insane to me. Mm-hmm. It was like, how are you this talented? Yeah. Your best dad, your worst dad, your worst murder. How are you... He's so How good. How are you all these things? He's so good at and, life. And I would say he's, like, not conventionally, like, the actors that you're used to seeing, right? He's not, like, this gorgeous man, which is, like, what the the main character of that is. I saw it's the like, devil guy. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, beautiful. But I would say even when he's being, like, as disgusting and awful as he was, I was still just, like, oh, man, I still kind of adore this guy. Like, I still, like... Really, am kind of. He had like a. He was disgusting, and he had this like kind of gruffness, like charmed him. Yeah, I don't think he can. He was so gross though, and I saw the devil. I really, it was hard for me, like to remember Train to Busan. Best dad, best dad, because he was cute as anything in Train to Busan. I was like crushing. Yeah. To sort of see him be like so gross, I was just like, oh. But there definitely were like rare moments where he wasn't saying something sexually explicit and disgusting or like wasn't murdering someone brutally brutally, where he was cute. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) I think that's just really (laughs) weird. That's a weird thing to say. I think we need therapy. Possibly. Probably. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I really liked the wailing. Um, I was worried about it because uh trusted friend jeff said he's tried to watch it a few times and it didn't work so jeff i understand why he struggled yes it was a, worth in, it. it was a long lead in to where stuff started to not be upsetting. it was honestly an hour in it was an hour in because i remember we were like how much time is left and we like clicked it and it was like almost an hour and that's when it started to pick up so it was yeah, a lot. and it was like kind of bad up until then. it was like go- it was weird. It was it like was weird. It was like this weird quirk, quirky zombie film. Like, oh, what a 
small town. How do we deal with zombies? And then it <laughs> totally took a hard left and was like, racism. And I was like, oh, God. I wasn't <laughs> I was like, ready. How did we get here? I'm so scared. They killed a dog. What is happening? Yo. Mm. That was like the big pivotal point where I was just That like, was bad now, cop, bad dad. Yeah, now I am upset. I was like, we need to turn this movie off. <laughs> I would, yeah. When you heard, yeah, you hear we the dog. Like, I heard him crying. I was like, give me this. It was me asking if he killed the dog. Yeah. Yeah. In cat speak. Um, he did. I was so dying sorry. inside. So it gets negative points for the fact that there was a dog death in it. Yeah. So that's Korean horror film. Do you have anything else you want to say about it? No, that's cool. Okay. Cool. Right. <laughs> um, we'll probably still watch more. Feel free to to leave us suggestions in the comments. Um, it is clearly becoming a favorite. Um, I really wish we could watch all of them. People keep every time we post this, people are like, "Have you seen this twenty other film that's in this genre?" And I'm mm -hmm. like, "Ugh, how many hours? Like, can I just quit my job and watch horror movies all day?" Um, or we just do this forever. <laughs> yeah. The ghouls will never die. We don't, and then if we did, we would just stick around and like haunt you and stuff. Yeah. Um, because we're men children. Uh, yeah. So for all you good dads out there, remember, don't, don't get, get married. married. Delete your, your kids. kids, and then you're not a best dad anymore because you don't got kids. You're not dad. You were like worst dad. He was OG worst dad because he ate kids. Yeah. He was the worst. He was OG worst husband. Honestly. He was all the bad. Yeah. Well. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>